and what do you also think about cat i don't think people should take cat at all yeah because the rates of acceptance are so low that even with the 99th percentile as you know you might not even get a call from any of the ims and i've had that one experience in the past already in my experience i've seen average students tend to do better on gmat than above average students and the reason is that our indian education system essentially thrives on memorization largely yeah. so you're telling me if you can't take out one to two hours during the weekdays don't say don't don't take it don't waste your time and how many mocks do you think we should be giving during the entire process jima doesn't provide a lot of mocks what happens now is that if you're not utilizing those mocks well you'll run out of them very quickly if you're actually targeting something like a 99th or 100th percentile you'll not be able to get an mba from top schools in us or europe they are also looking for scholarships okay and so in terms of scholarships it will it, make a it huge does. it makes a huge difference because usually for indian students we don't we don't get need based scholarship there are exceptions we don't get need based right? scholarship we get merit based scholarships and merit based scholarships gmat plays a huge role right so the higher the score that you have the higher the chances there is no cut off the way it is for cats for instance no matter how sharp you are or brilliant you are is the second piece that i feel a lot of people don't take into account when they prepare they get so absorbed in their work for instance at times that they study hard for two days saturday and sunday they spend 10 hours 12 hours studying on the gmat and then they completely let go of it for like 3 4 days and again they wake up and they say i have to study for gmat they study intensely and this kind of erratic preparation where you spending extremely long hours in certain days and not spending any time on the other day essentially just nullifies your effort in this video i have manan with me he's the only gmat coach in india that has helped a student get a perfect score on gmat we have talked about how you can get into a good school with your gmat score you can get scholarships based on your gmat score and most importantly how an average student can get a good gmat score so make sure to watch this video till the end and i'm sure agar aap ye pura video dekhte ho na to aapka gmat score at least 20 points se better ho jana chahiye and there are some people who reach out to me tell me murad this university is giving me a waiver should I, and what do you think about waivers in general gmat waivers see honestly before i answer that question i feel that mba as a degree is fast losing its appeal <laughs> right and i just don't think it's worth going to any school except maybe the top 5 to 10 in that country that's exactly what i talk about right? probably so, in us going to a few more schools but any other correct. country yeah. just top 10 top 5 to 10 that's it like even if you do get in with a 100% scholarship it's better to not go and i have seen people and the reason behind that is very straightforward right like the kind of learning that you can have right now in the corporate setup or startup culture that we have in india in two years it cannot substitute the kind of learning you would have in a average you know, university, average university yeah. or a tier 2 school so firstly i clearly tell people who ever is coming to me that please don't apply to any school beyond 5 or 10 if you get through great if you don't get through you're better off not going Now if you want to get into the top 5 or 10 schools then GMAT is an absolute must. And the fact that as we discussed earlier we are an overrepresented demographic in the pool of applicants then GMAT score becomes even more important for us than for let's say African Americans who are underrepresented. So the G- the question about GMAT wa- waiver like there's, there's no, no question. Uh, what do you think about going to an average school studying abroad in an average school? it doesn't make sense right like you have to be clear as to why are you going if you're going for a vacation great <laughs> i think it's amazing you'll meet new people you make friends all of that is great but if you're actually going there to up level your career i think there are better ways that you can utilize those two years it's not about money i'm saying the time is so important at this point like the kind of shift that's happening because of ai and we've seen in the last one one and a half years itself the kind of shift that has happened Imagine somebody wasting his time 2 years in a tier 2 school instead of actually getting into um any of these startups that are you know sort of seeped into these technological advances they can stand to learn a lot more in these 2 years than they would ever stand to gain from the 2 year MBA also i think even for the top tier schools people don't go there for the sake of knowledge anymore right the reason why people attend MBA schools in my opinion is basically they want to get plugged into that ecosystem of overachievers and when you get plugged into that ecosystem of over, overachievers that basically opens up so many opportunities that you otherwise would not have been able to have right but when you go to a tier 2 school your network itself is not that good 
So, so basically you're talking about the network effect that happens in top schools. You're the average of five people you're surrounded exactly. with. Exactly. Network effect and I'm saying even the ones who have graduated before you, right? If you were to say that I'm from your school, like chances are they might actually be seated in a very high position in a particular company you want to get a job at and they might open doors for you. But would you be able to say the same thing about uh, an average school? Exceptions are always there. Exceptions but I'm saying are... that for most people it doesn't make sense. like really what do you think about cat exam i don't think people should take cat at all yeah because the rates of acceptance are so low that even with the 99th percentile as you know you might not even get a call from any of the iims and i've had that one experience in the past already where a student scored i think some 99.12 percentile and did not like let alone getting an acceptance he did not even get a call from any of the iims probably a general category student must be must be a general category student and that's why for those kinds of people having a fallback always helps but then at least giving cat makes sense right i mean you can but don't like put all your uh, put, don't put all your all your eggs in one basket in the sense and also like because i know for a fact how depressed people get when they know their entire year has gone to waste because if you wake up one day on the wrong side of bed for instance if you have your cat exam and you're not feeling in the zone so to speak and you don't perform well and it can happen to anybody right even virat kohli doesn't score a century in every match yeah. so you can't expect somebody to be at their peak level of performance on one particular day of the year so that's when having a fallback actually relieves a lot of burden from their shoulders and they're able to then go full out and say okay even if this doesn't happen i know i can always back on i can rely on something else and more often than not like just having a fallback allows them to actually reach to their uh, max level of performance but at least in mba colleges in india you get a good cat percentile there the some sort of predictability that you'll get into a good college what about international universities uh how important is gmat for us indians or if i take a larger pool of applicants specifically Asians, for indians yeah for indians i think it's extremely important it's like Why? make or break for most because we belong to an overrepresented demographic right almost 50% of the class is going to be either uh, either an indian or an asian right so you kind of have to understand when it comes to gmat and all b schools especially international b schools are looking for diversity they wouldn't want to crowd their class with just indians and because of because there's so much competition between ourselves we actually end up shooting the average gmat score requirement by 20 30 points so for instance if the global oh. average score is around a 710 for a particular school for an indian applicant it would be around a 730 or a 740 and i'm talking about the classic version here because the stats for focus edition are still not out but at least 20 30 points higher than the global average and that is primarily because of diversity in my experience i've seen average students tend to do better on gmat than above average students and and the reason is that our indian education system essentially thrives on memorization largely yeah. and people who are good at memorizing typically do not fare well on exams such as gmat because it requires more of creative thinking hands on application of reasoning and concepts and it doesn't require something that could be just like memorized and regurgitated on the exam right whereas these people who are below average so to speak they are mostly not good with memorizing which is one of the main reasons that they are not able to perform well in the indian education system and these people if they were to opt for an exam such as the gmat which is which rewards creative thinking they tend to do well and that's why a lot of people who don't do well in cat and other competitive exams end up doing so well on gmat you can look up stories online i have a lot of stories to share where people got a a 89th 90th percentile on cat after 2 years of rigorous preparation ended up getting a bit and chance. they ended up getting like a 99th percentile on the gmat in a mu- in mere 3 months so by all means i think uh, below average students tend to have a much better chance of getting a better score on gmat than do above average students and where do you think students go wrong in their gmat preparation so you've seen so many preparations what's that piece where you feel like oh kya kar raha hai I think misguided efforts and following a random plan of action would be my top two reasons. So misguided efforts because like they feel okay my friend did something and I should basically do the same thing but no matter how close you are to your friend you are after all two separate individuals. Okay. So whatever your friend's strengths and weaknesses are might not be your strengths and weaknesses. So following the st- same plan of action doesn't work. 
and second i feel that making sure that you are staying consistent no matter how sharp you are or brilliant you are is the second piece that i feel a lot of people don't take into account when they prepare they get so absorbed in their work for instance at times that they study hard for two days saturday and sunday they spend 10 hours 12 hours studying on the gmat and then they completely let go of it for like 3 4 days and again they wake up and they say i have to study for gmat they study intensely and this kind of erratic preparation where you're spending extremely long hours on certain days and not spending any time on the other days essentially just nullifies your effort and you're back to square one so what about a person who is working or is in college can't take out time during the weekdays what sort of preparation strategy would you recommend to such a person i wouldn't recommend anything to that person i would say that you first need to carve out at least 1 to 1 and a half hours a day like that's the bare minimum every day regardless of regardless it being of a week what happens yes so and i'm telling you i get people from uh, who are who are working in private equity i have people working in consulting i have got people working in startups and you can imagine like Maybe extremely sure. erratic work schedules hectic jobs Just carving out 1 1 and a half hours is actually more about time management than it is about really like whether you have the time or not it's about making time and no matter who you are if like mukesh ambani can take out a uh, time to read four books in a month after doing the kind of businesses that he does i'm fairly certain that we are talking about people in college we are talking about people who are working for like 4 5 years like you can't imagine them shouldering the same level of responsibilities that somebody like mukesh ambani shoulders and still able to take out time for reading 3 to 4 books in a month right so i think 1 1 and a half hours is bare minimum it's non negotiable if you don't have it don't study you might as well take it up later talk to somebody at your workplace right get them in your corner tell them that i'm studying for gmat and there are people who are very supportive also i've seen there are people in my own community uh, who actually went up to a senior of theirs and said that i'm preparing for gmat because i know that's something that will help me to unlock the next level of performance would you please support me in not giving me some heavy projects for the next 2 3 months and you'll be surprised like people actually do want to support you to grow so you're telling me if you can't take out 1 to 2 hours during the weekdays don't, don't study it. yeah don't don't take it don't waste your time take out time when you and you can get this done within 2 months also you can get this done within just 3 months also but if you do not have the time to study consistently erratic performances will not work if you want a more detailed answer the reason behind this is that gmat is just 15 to 20% 20% concepts and 80 to 85% application application of concepts application of tricks understanding and avoiding traps like these are the kinds of things that really boost your score to a 99th percentile if you're talking about 80 85% application based stuff and you are only studying on the weekends and you're not applying that at all from monday to friday chances are you will get rusty on those with that break of 4 to 5 days and you'll be almost back to square one It's like you know you move two steps forward and then one, one step. step back two steps forward one step back and that back and forth creates so much frustration in people because they don't see the needle moving quickly and that frustration invariably becomes a mental block I have seen such extremely smart people who could have cleared the GMAT in a matter of 2 or 3 months but they have not been able to ace it for 2 years primarily because of this right so I suggest to people that please don't waste your energy don't waste your time it's okay if you don't have the time right now because i know as far as your job is concerned not everyone everything would be in your control i know you need to get approvals and all get those things in place have those one and a half to two hours in a day to spend for gmat consistently and then you start otherwise it won't matter someone who is just starting out with man having 11 years of experience what do you recommend to that person what should their strategy look like um the strategy should start with a quick assessment and you can get that assessment from uh, mba.com so they do have free mocks free mocks you can take any one of them to see where you are it could also start with official guide they have bunch of questions which are actual gmat problems so you can see where you are or it can even start with a live assessment the way we do it right so we invite students on a zoom call where we have them solve questions with us and then based on not their accuracy but their approach is it free of cost it's completely free of cost okay. so they can actually understand what their strengths and weaknesses are and then we help them devise a plan of action based on the assessment that's the starting point and trust me that is like half the battle won if you have the right plan of action almost half the battle is won after that obviously you need to refine it it's not going to be perfect you will have to visit it after a week or 10 days to see if it's still working for you or some changes need to be made 
but once you get that right plan of action set that usually makes everything else easier for you as far as your gmat journey is concerned so to sum it you're saying go ahead with an mba.com ka mock or else your assessment after that you would ideally give them an, a plan of correct. action and based on that after 10 days we have to revise it correct and how many mocks do you think we should be giving during the entire process it's basically about utilization of mocks than the number of mocks themselves because i gma doesn't provide a lot of mocks hmm. there are only six mocks that you have anywhere you can reset them that's a different matter but you but have only six the same questions so. correct so hmm. pool of questions is fairly common right so what happens now is that if you're not utilizing those mocks well you'll run out of them very quickly mm-hmm. and somebody who's coming from a cat background where people essentially prepare 90% on mocks only those people end up running out of mocks in the very first week of their preparation and then they're left scrambling so you think mocks aren't that important mocks are important it is the analysis which is more important mm-hmm. which is what we as indians are not good at is what i've seen especially students right like mostly if you're weak at something instead of actually trying to uncover what the root cause is we try to use brute force and power through it doesn't work on the gmat i'll give you an example recently i was uh, on a call with a student who took a mock test as per the stats she made the most mistakes on reading comprehension hmm. most people in her position would, would have obviously more practiced more reading reading comprehension agreed but we dug a little deeper and i asked her like how come you've made so many mistakes on reading comprehension when you were doing so well in practice so she said that um the initial few questions on cr on critical reasoning took up a lot of time okay and i said ha huh, i think that's surprising initial few questions tend to be easy like how did you take so much time on the easier questions on critical reasoning and then she said that it was because the last section which is quant that did not go well for her and she was fixated on that in the initial portion of her verbal section so to so it all led up to that thing so to cut the long story short a pacing chart of quant actually took care of all her performance issues in verbal so it wasn't verbal that she had to actually work on it and that's why people reach a plateau no like they keep they feel okay in that analysis that the mock tests have spat up it must be the truth and i need to work on rc because that is what it shows to be the like the Weak weakness area. or that's where i've made most mistakes but generally speaking those mistakes could be an offshoot of something deeper and recognizing what that is allows people to reach the ne- next level of performance how often does this happen quite often you'll be surprised in pretty much all the cases it happens like every second person i'm talking to it's usually never that one issue itself that is leading to their drop in score or a plateau in score it's something that's more fundamental deeper that allows people to be able to understand what's actually happening and that's what we help them with right like and there's this one framework that we use that other people can also use which is to not just look at what has happened but to ask three whys okay right so what has happened is she made most mistakes on rc that's the what level analysis which any mock test will give you hmm. any study portal will give you you've made maximum mistakes on rc hmm. next is why did you make those mistakes so then the answer that she came up with was i may i did not have time in cr why did you not have time in cr because of the quant because quant did not go well and one thing led to the other and then you realize what the root cause is and that's how people are able to get to a high score in a short amount of time and that's why brute force doesn't work like imagine no matter how hard working she would have been she could have spent months and years working on rc trying to improve it and improve it and improve it it might still not have reflected in her score had she not taken care of these underlying issues how do i as a student get to know about this like i gave the gmat honestly even after getting such a high score you ask me murad where did you go wrong i don't know i mean that's what i'm saying that's why people need help right like most students do not have that analytical bent of mind it's not trained in us since our school days no teacher would have told you like think about why did you make a mistake like introspect meditate on it nobody says that mostly people say you've made a mistake on coordinate geometry go solve 10 questions on coordinate geometry yeah, they'll be sorted right? that's so, exactly what i did so that's what the point is and it like after a point in time it doesn't work like with that sheer brute force you will be able to get yourself up to maybe 80th percentile 85th percentile but you're if you're actually targeting something like a 99th or 100th percentile you'll not be able to get there and this is one guy arsh anand who joined me after having studied for gmat for 2 years and he took multiple different 
like coaching uh, coachings from different places and pretty much everyone especially these commercialized places tend to have this one standard plan of action that they want everyone to follow one fit for all right one fit for all and it doesn't work like that like it's not you have to take into account where is the person struggling and what is it that will spark a breakthrough in his journey and it is different for different people and because it's not scalable it's very personal at least until now it's not scalable that's the reason why the commercialized institutions do not tend to pre- like they don't tend to emphasize a lot on this so with me i try to keep it fairly like you know personal, personal and i want to keep it short where i just want to understand where is the person coming from give them actionable insights and that invariably with the years of experience that i now have i've seen so many different success stories that i know that if somebody is not able to get to a next level what might be stopping him and we give them a few suggestions we have milestones and checkpoints set into their preparation to track their progress and lo and behold after a little bit of tweaking here and there usually they are able to get that breakthrough so talking about this high score you are talking about 100 percentile and all how do you think what would be the strategy towards it how can i get that perfect gmat 800 score old gmat 800 score any strategies for that coincidentally and it's very surprising also i wasn't really uh, meaning to share this but like right now i'm the only coach who has helped somebody get a perfect score on the gmat right nobody in india at least right now has been able to help somebody get a perfect score on gmat wow. <laughs> so i know exactly what it takes to get to a perfect score on the gmat and what it actually requires is as i said earlier more of an analytical bent of mind more strategic not brute force so when i talk to these people especially the ones who are looking at that 100th percentile i ask them that you know are you do you have the patience to follow the plan of action i share for you because the faster you try to do something the longer it takes so i say that do you have the patience to follow the plan of action if you're targeting something like a 100th percentile if you want to get to a 90th percentile that i can do for you in a month month and a half i'll give you a plan of action we'll talk a few times in between and you'll get there but the journey from a 90th percentile to 100th percentile is absolutely different for everyone that i've coached so far but the person needs to have the right intent that i'm not going to stop until i get there and that's where patience is such an important thing where you can't say that i want to get there in 2 months nobody can promise you something like that but if you say that manan i'll stick with your course of plan of action i am going to make sure that i follow this and come back to you with the feedback i know i'll have the right suggestions for that person to be able to make that incremental improvement it's just like when you're climbing mount everest right until base camp no issues anybody can go but how do you go from the base camp or maybe like once you've gotten to something that's that's near to the summit but it's not exactly the summit the last stretch is actually the most difficult stretch which is where most people give up like they say okay i'm okay with is the 90th percentile worth, is it worth the oh, effort absolutely so you're saying uh, if someone is getting 95 percentile is there a huge difference between 95 and 100 percentile in the in the in terms of the admits nothing in else. terms of admits no in terms of, in terms of admits it's more or less going to be the same but if in even at a 95 percentile and 100 percentile more or less the admit absolutely it's the, the difference putting in so many efforts on gmat wouldn't make a difference in terms of admits no but most people who are looking for an mba from top schools in us or europe they are also looking for scholarships Okay, and so in terms of scholarships, it would it, make a it huge does. difference. It makes a huge difference because usually for Indian students, we don't we don't get need based scholarship. There are mm-hmm. exceptions. We don't get need based right? scholarship. We get merit based scholarships, mm-hmm. and merit based scholarships, GMAT plays a huge role, right? So the higher the score that you have, the higher the chances. There is no cut off the way it is for CATs, for instance, but it does boost up your chances quite a bit. So matters. So you're saying that. your gmat score a highest gmat score will help you get a scholarship but it won't make a huge difference in terms of your in admits. terms of admits it won't so for instance for the classic version earlier it was the 740 like if you've scored a 740 or more no business school in the world can reject you on the grounds of gmat score ah oh, okay right if you do end up getting rejected you would get rejected because, because of, of applications else, interviews yeah. or whatever similarly now with the focus edition that safe score is around a 685 Six eighty five is around a ninety seventh percentile, ninety sixth, ninety seventh percentile. If you scored that much, then you know for a fact that no business school in the world will reject you on the grounds of GMAT score. If you then end up getting rejected again, it might have to do with something else. But at least as far as 
like the meeting the expectations of the admissions committee is concerned that is sorted so what do you think about the focus edition is it a good thing bad thing why did they i mean i don't know, I don't know why did they do that but what do you think about it focus edition i think overall is a good thing um for multiple reasons one they've let go of these topics that were more mechanical in nature like sentence correction for instance i hated it yeah Parallel most people of... most people hated it because there were like a bunch of rules you had to memorize and again like the people who were not good with memorizing did not fare well mm. on sentence correction and then geometry was again a pain point for most people especially when you're trying to get done with the question in less than 2 minutes and you have this very abstruse intimidating figure in front of you on the screen <laughs> people don't know what to do of it should True. i draw it not draw it calculate not calculate take a guess what like there's absolutely no way and then there's also this new uh new addition which is that you can go back and change up to 3 answers, answers per section and more or less that those are the answers that we change i have not seen people change four or five answers exactly and you don't have the time by the way you do not have the time to actually be able to change more than three answers anyhow so that also allows people to just be a little more calm and relaxed on the exam because otherwise once you lock in the answer in the classic version it's, it's gone <laughs> right now people know that even if in case they're not confident they can flag it and come back to it and change it so that allows them to be more relaxed so people who are anxious for instance test takers because the stakes are going to be high on the exam right so having these kinds of things definitely allows people to be a little more collected on the on the day of the exam and then finally i think the shorter version we are constantly distracted at this point like so with much, the reels and all yeah with reels and everything uh, people's uh, sp- the attention span has obviously gone down a lot so a shorter uh, version of the exam it's just 2 hours 15 minutes now which actually helps a lot so that's another added point so overall i think it's it's for the better how do i know that i should get a tuition a tutor for gmat So two things one if you are somebody with a strategic bent of mind if you can put in the work consistently and you can bring some accountability to the, to the table where you know that if i've set myself a target i'll get this done you don't need anyone oh. right you can do it, do this on your own and uh, i would be happy to give you a personalized like a plan of action that you can follow and that will be taken care of no coaching required <clears throat> on the other hand if in case you're someone with an erratic work schedule you've had problems with consistency then you need an anchor in your life to hold you accountable to study for gmat as i said before there is no substitute for consistency right so if you're not able to study consistently for whatever reason you need an anchor that can sort of get help you to get the work done and that's where i think the daily classes that i offer also help a lot of people because we're doing live classes every day monday to friday from 9:30 to 11 pm at night which is after office hours for most people so even if they can't get anything else done at least getting that much work done every day allows people to make steady progress which feeds motivation and then on the weekends there is marathon practice that we do okay what's that so marathon practice is one of the quickest ways for you to master any given topic on the gmat right in the last 11 years you understand primarily people who are working professionals not all working professionals but primarily they are working professionals who take gmat so these people are always on a lookout for like how do i master this thing in the shortest amount of time possible and i've tried a bunch of learning styles spaced repetition pomodoro's technique i'm sure you would have heard of it like what 25 minutes of practice 5 minutes of break 25 minutes like i've i've tried a bunch of different things i've had people on a sabbatical who studied for like 6 7 hours in a day 1 hour in the morning 2 hours in the afternoon 2 hours in the evening so on and so forth something that is completely blown me away is the extent of progress that's possible with marathon sessions so these are 4 hours of intensive practice sessions on one topic so if when you're chipping away at something for 4 hours on the trot when you're hammering away at something for 4 hours at a stretch then the consolidation of your efforts and learning allows you to recognize certain blind spots that scattered practice does not allow if you're doing scattered practice that consolidation is very difficult right what did you do throughout the day that would allow you to see some patterns in terms of your blind spots that can spark a breakthrough it's difficult but when you're consolidating everything in 4 hours and you're consistently hammering away and pounding away at something for 4 hours that allows you to be able to recognize those blind spots that otherwise become almost next to impossible to recognize and that gets people to break through 
so four hours of consistent practice on saturday and four hours of consistent practice on sunday, sunday. and then about one and a half to two hours that you do on the weekdays yes. in five weeks straight people generally tend to underestimate how much progress is possible in one one and a half months like people tend to take it lightly but the ones who actually do put in the work because everything is thought out it is not something which is like we are randomly experimenting like we've seen certain things that have allowed people to get to the next level of performance without accumulating backlog if somebody does that they've been blown away with the progress they've seen in just 5 weeks so what do you think is the ideal time to study if i have to I have no idea when should i give the gmat ideal time to take the gmat would be between 2 and a half to 4 months for most people if you have only let's say 1 and a half to 2 hours to prepare a day if you have more time we've had people who've taken the exam in less than 10 days also but that largely as i said because most people can't afford to spend more than you know 1 and a half to 2 hours a day so that's what's realistic i guess and how many hours do you think we should study on the weekends 4 hours and 1 and a half hours 2 hours on that's weekdays sufficient. works so for someone who probably does not have the funds to take an entire coaching what are some things that you recommend official guide or what else would you recommend to that person i think official guide is a must um but again i think it just boils down to making sure that they are utilizing the official guide correctly because as i said if you're pardon my language but if you're mindlessly solving questions right without analyzing your mistakes you'll get done with the official guide and if, like i have had people who have done official guide two to three times over two to three times over and not getting anywhere and there are people who've done barely 50% of it and they've been able to get to their target score only at the back of official guide no training no coaching so one i think it's about utilizing the official sources very carefully because all the other unofficial sources no matter how reputed they are in terms of like which test prep company is offering what it can't match the quality and the standards of the official content right so it's the gold standard and that needs to be utilized effectively mm. and same is the case with mocks so if you use the official guides well and you use the official mocks well and by well as I, as i said it means that you analyze every single mistake that you make and not just try to power through the questions and all you will be able to get to a respectable score that is around 90th percentile and after 90th percentile to get to 100th percentile as i mentioned earlier you need to get a little more introspective in terms of asking those three to four why's as to what is the underlying cause of the mistake i made and then you essentially bridge that last 10 percentile gap but uh, it's very much possible if somebody has the intent and what are your thoughts about gmat club oh gmat club is a great resource um i it's just that there is a lot of information so people are overwhelmed by it mm. um and they're starving for like personalized actionable insights that will help them to move the needle forward but for somebody who as you said uh doesn't have enough funds to go for gmat coaching i think would benefit would stand to benefit a lot from gmat club and uh, how many times do you think is too many times stop giving gmat don't give it more i think no one really cares about the number of attempts till the time you can show a gradual progression in terms of your score think about it right if somebody is taking the gmat 5 times without any improvement so to speak then that doesn't paint a good picture in terms of the trust you can put in that person to be able to let's say withstand the rigorous b school curriculum like if somebody is just taking the gmat 5 times scored a 70th percentile doesn't it show a lack of awareness lack of self awareness on that person's part to be able to recognize what his weaknesses are and then to create a strategy to overcome it like that's the kind of picture it paints in the eyes of admissions committee if you've not been able to improve your score but on the other hand with every mistake you made you've been able to improve even by 30 points 40 points whatever it does show that you are somebody who is not willing to settle and persevere for or as long as it takes to get to the target that you and set that might actually be an even better story it will be a great story to sell right mm-hmm. it will be a great story you've got tangible proof that you don't settle after like two failed attempts and especially in the usb schools i think there's a very high tolerance for failure it's only in india that it's looked down upon that you've taken it two times failed at it three times failed at it but if somebody is able to show sustainable improvement and is able to get to a high score in the fifth attempt it might be looked at positively that somebody who gets there in first attempt itself you get where i'm going with this in terms of the story that you can sell um 
so yeah i mean uh, no no number is as such too many you can take it even more than 5 times but till the time you're able to show meaningful improvement i think it will be taken in good light and what do you think about youtube videos like a 8 hour session which teaches you everything about gmat do you think that can help me improve my score so first of all i have tremendous respect for your channel particularly because you put up extremely good content Thank but unfortunately so i can't say that for a lot of the other channels out there and what i feel is when i interact with people on a one to one basis they are so overwhelmed and with confused with information with information and they're like they're starved for some actionable insights that can help them to move forward so i have clear instruction by the way when anyone joins the course that if you've put your trust and faith in me then please put blinders on and let me be the only source of information for all gmat related questions you might have i'm going to answer every single one of them for you do not have to go to any forum or any other place for information and the reason is that see somebody might put up a youtube video saying i got 100 percentile using this approach somebody else might put up a youtube video saying i got a 99th percentile using that approach there are 20 ways for you to be able to get to 100 percentile how would you as a person working a full time job be able to figure out out of those 20 ways which is the right approach for you and that is the reason why i'm saying like people keep running in these loops they're not able to gr- break past that because they're not able to get something that they can actually say like let me just not think about any more options here let me full give me my full dedication to this one approach and that usually does it for them and apart from this what do you think mistakes students to a good student does while they're preparing for gmat one of the biggest mistakes that even the smartest students make is that they tend to focus on time way too soon in their preparation time is important gmat It is all about time so see time and speed like how you manage time and speed that's largely an offshoot of how well you've internalized the right approaches the concepts so for instance if you want to make money like you can't just obsess about money alone there has to be something that gets you money similarly if you're trying to work on speed you can't obsess about like i'm going to work on speed 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 if something like for instance if your approaches are wrong if in case you're taking 10 steps if you write 10 steps to get to an answer for a particular question how much time can you save by pushing yourself to solve it faster maybe a few seconds here and there but it wouldn't really be meaningful so you need to first learn the right approaches to attack questions with and not worry about time at all and this might sound extremely counterintuitive all of my students who have gone on to score a 99th percentile or 100th percentile all of my students have had this one common denominator that they've barely worked on timing for a week to 10 days before their exam so you're saying Just don't work on days. time 10 days before the till 10 days before the that's exam. the common denominator and the reason is very simple i'll tell you because once you've internalized the right approach the concepts more like concepts still i think is easy it's the way, way to apply, apply the, concepts, the concepts i think that's what's more important and that's what takes more that's what takes more time once you internalize the right approaches then you're already there because the approaches are so efficient that without having to like push yourself where you're huffing and puffing at the finish line of the exam you are able to still complete the test on so time so the focus should be on applications think about any competitive sport right if you talk about swimming for instance let's say your goal is that you want to be an olympic level swimmer when you first dip your feet in the pool would the strategy be let me just keep flap my hands and feet as fast as i can so that i can get as fast as those olympic level swimmers like that's never the first thing that you do get a good body bro <laughs> you focus on getting the right shape you focus on the right form the right technique of swimming and once that is internalized then isn't speed a natural offshoot like if you're able to streamline your body and move your heads and uh, hands and legs in the right way you will automatically get faster without even exerting as much effort haven't you seen like these people and i'm talking about rural area rural areas of india these people in the rural areas who've been swimming in their like whatever local pond, pond. and stuff they might have they've been swimming there for years and there is let's say a 3 year old baby or maybe 3 years too too early let's say 5 or 6 year old uh, kid who learns to swim with the right approach in 6 months that person can beat that person who might actually be swimming with haphazard random approaches for years and that is the importance of approach and that is what gives you the speed 
So don't focus on speed directly. Focus on the approach that will get you the speed. And that's the gravest mistake that people make. What do you think was the biggest success story for you? Like one story which you're the most happiest about? The one that made me the happiest was about uh, Arsh. So as I said, like this student actually had done everything possible you can imagine, Arsh. Uh, sorry, uh, everything possible that you can imagine in terms of concept clarity, application, everything. But for some reason, he wasn't able to get that 99th percentile on the day of the exam. Something was stopping him from getting there. And uh, even if I, I may ask, what were his, his scores before that? So before that, I think he scored, I don't remember the score exactly. Like I average. It must be around an 85th percentile or something. Average like. scores. So he did kind of uh, take the exam multiple times and that's kind of the best that he got. And then after that, I think uh, once we started focusing on his weaknesses, uh, especially when he was taking the mock tests, we could realize that there are these very fundamental things that he's going wrong in. So for instance, not letting go of the question after two and a half minutes. A lot of us take it on our ego, right? Like when you're not question, able to solve a question, I'll solve it. And it's very difficult for people to just like you, it's not as easy to do it as it is to say it. So when I say that you should leave a question after two and a half, three minutes, People have this mental dialogue that I spent three minutes on it already. Sunk cost fallacy, right? That you already spent three minutes on it already. Might as well spend 30 seconds more on it. I might get the answer. And now that you spent three and a half minutes on it, you know that you better get this question right because you spent so much time on it. It's same as when you're investing money into something, right? Yeah, I might just invest a bit more and probably get a better return. Exactly. And, and that is essentially the fallacy that allows them not to complete the test on time. And the way the GMAT scoring algorithm is designed, it penalizes you if in case you don't finish the test on time. And that's like the penalty is so huge that even if you, in case you've done extremely well for the first, maybe like two thirds of the exam, but if you're not, if you don't have the time to, let's say even mark answers for the last four or five questions, that'll just plummet your score. Are there any tips that you give to a student who's going to give the exam in probably a week? Uh, I do share tips but those are largely based on person's temperament so if somebody is extremely anxious for instance then the tips would be around how to manage anxiety right how would you say that so managing anxiety essentially depends on a couple of factors one understanding that there is always a fallback i believe is a huge way for people to let off steam so what i mean by that is if you know it's not cat where your entire year is ruined because your one exam did not go well. It's GMAT, you can take it again after 16 days. That allows people to just be relaxed. I said, in your mind, just think that you'll take it again. Just take it as a mock test. It doesn't mean anything. And especially when you reduce the importance of the test, where you say that you can always cancel it. It won't really impact your uh, candidature in any way. Why fret over it? You've been taking mocks. You've been scoring well in the mocks. Let this be another mock and get it out of the way. It doesn't happen. We'll take it again. No big deal. So that is a huge way for people to relieve themselves of all the stress and tension that they're carrying into the exam. And that allows them to be more centered. And then second, understanding the fundamental nature of the algorithm, as I mentioned. So I practically, I keep it very real and practical that, see, this is the way the algorithm works. And if in case you're anxious, chances are you might end up over indexing on the first few questions. You might spend more time on the first few questions than you would for the latter ones, where you actually need to spend more time because those are, those are harder, those are harder questions. questions. So that might, you know, completely ruin your performance anyway. So it's important for you to make sure that you stick to the pacing strategy that we have discussed and at any point not waver from it and not get too attached to any question. Reminding them of sunk cost fallacy also helps a lot. So these are main three things that I do apart from all the, you know, personalized touch that you have to provide to them in terms of their exact background and journey. So in this, uh, one more co point came to my mind. So GMAT allows us to take the exam whichever way we want. We can take cons first, verbal second, data insights at the end or whichever way we want. Which one do you think is the best approach which has ideally helped students? I ideally, it depends on the student, but which one do you think is a better approach? Generally speaking, verbal quant DI works better for most people than any other approach. And predominantly because most students preparing for GMAT do not have as hard a time with quant and DI as they do have with verbal. 
in my so you want to get that done with so if you know that there is like one of the areas that you are weak at it's like eating the frog first right mm. so you, whatever is the hardest thing or the most challenging thing for you if you get it out of the way from uh, from the exam in the initial few uh, in in the initial few minutes itself that does free up a lot of your mental bandwidth to then invest on those sections that are easier for you mm-hmm. so psychologically speaking i think it just so whatever is the hardest for you hmm. you would recommend to get started with, with it that. get done with it and Correct. then move on to something and again there are pay. exceptions to it but that's usually one of the go to um, go to sequences i suggest to students what do you recommend would you recommend giving gre gre for sure i think it's acceptable by a lot of institutes uh, nowadays the, the line between gmat and gre has it's blurred it's so blurred that no one it's non existent yeah. so you can take gre you can take gmat frankly it just depends on what your strengths are and i recommend that if in case you are somebody who's who has an aptitude for quant it makes sense to go for gmat if in case you've got uh, aptitude for verbal reasoning uh, it makes sense to go for gre usually that's how i suggest people at a higher level and then obviously people can take diagnostic tests from ets website or mba.com and figure out which is the test which is more suited to them and is there any final recommendation that you would give to a student who's planning to give gmat within next two months final recommendation um in next two months okay i would suggest um the number Take one thing no no i think number one thing when it comes to the last two months of your preparation is that you focus more on taking diagnost the mock tests that mba.com offers um and basing your preparation largely on the feedback that you get from the mocks instead of starting with something that most people follow right so lot lot of people say let me just cover all the concepts once and then i'll do a lot of practice and then i'm going to start with my mock tests now if you've got a very short span of time to work or prepare for gmat it makes sense to basically be extremely meticulous about your weaknesses from day 1 so if you're weakest you could have 10 weaknesses but if you think that the number one weakness for you right now is reading comprehension forget about the other nine weaknesses focus on reading comprehension get that out of the way write a and mock test and see how much have you improved and then once you've got that reading comprehension out of the way what's the next biggest weakness you have you work on that then you take so what that does for people who basically are preparing on their own is that they're able to see a lot of jump in terms of their score so they might start at let's say 4425 435 and then because they've gotten that number one weakness out of the way they'll see a huge jump in score and that gives them great confidence that okay I'm moving in the right direction and then again the spike is decent enough for them to get that confidence back especially for people who are working on their own and don't have any kind of uh, coaching or mentoring available that's what works best but for other people who are taking coaching and mentoring for those people making sure that you know you are able to carve out a window of 2 to 2 and a half hours is the most important piece of advice that i can give them like everything else pales in comparison to that one advice i could give you 10 strategies 10 approaches 10 hacks 10 tips tricks and all but if you don't have even 2 hours to implement those things it would be no use and just one final thing that came to my mind do you think gmat would become redundant i hope not um, <laughs> that's <because. laughs> i hope not uh, but i honestly don't think it sh- it would become redundant uh, given that you know the demand for the top schools has only increased in the last few years and you need to have a filtering mechanism to be able to understand who's the right fit not the right fit and standardized tests typically tend to do that for b schools so unless uh, for some reason some advancement happens that suddenly sort of dampens the demand for the top schools i don't really see gmat or gre going anywhere you talked about the demand and you particularly have seen people go to top schools do you think it makes sense to hire these expert professional coaches to help you get into those top schools I know people I know my friends have paid 3 lakhs 5 lakhs 7 lakhs to get into these top schools do you think it's worth it only if you're applying to top schools it's worth it uh because there are a lot of aspects of application that are not intuitive to us as indians right whether we talk about undergrad or school days like the kind of effort that's required beyond getting done with the standardized test is just insane 
and so you think it's still worth it? it's worth it especially for applying for top i've i've, I've had people who paid like 10 lakhs for applications to just five schools right so um and if you do with their help get into uh, a top school such as let's say harvard or wharton or stanford uh that does kind of pay for itself multiple times over in next 2 to 3 years max and with their help because they would know the ins and outs of like what is it the admission committee prefers that might at the end of it help you to be able to get a scholarship as well that would anyway pay for whatever you've paid right so um it does make sense if you're targeting the top schools because that will pale in comparison to the opportunities it would unlock for you so it might just be penny wise and dollar foolish correct thank you so much for taking out no the worries. time man i hope you enjoyed this video you can fill the form in the description to get a free assessment call by enzo and if you like this video on gmat i recommend you to watch this video